Hello folks, and thank you for joining me for tonight's reading. And, uh, let's see. This is the one we're going to read. And it is Chapters of Masonic History, Mithraism. It's, uh, be by Brother H.L. Haywood, Editor of the Builder, and the Builder from uh, May 1923. And this is part three. And it's Mithraism. Or Mithraism. Mithraism. However you want to pronounce. Freemasonry and the ancient mysteries. The theory that modern Freemasonry is some sense a direct descendant from the ancient mysteries has held a peculiar attraction for Masonic writers for a long time. And the end is not yet, for the world is rife with men who argue about the matter up and down endless pages of print. It is a most difficult subject to write about, so that the more one learns about it, the less he is inclined to ventilate any opinions of his own. The subject covers so much ground and in such tangled jungles that almost any grand generalization is pretty sure to be either wrong or useless. Even Gould who is usually one of the soundest and carefulest of generalizers, gets pretty badly mixed up on the subject. For present purposes, it has seemed to me wise to attention to one only of the mysteries, letting it stand as a type of the rest, and I have chosen for that purpose Mithraism. One of the greatest and one of the most interesting, as well as one possessing as many paraliz paralyzms as Freemasonry as with Freemasonry as any of the others. How Mithra came to be a first class god. Way back in the beginning of things, so we may learn from the Avista, Mithra was the young god of the skylights that appeared just before sunrise and lingered after the sun had set. To him was attributed patronage Patronship of the virtues of truth, life-giving, and youthful strength and joy. Such qualities attracted many worshippers in those whose eyes Mithra grew from more to more until he finally became a great god in his own right and almost equal to the sun god himself. Youth will be served, even, even a youthful god, and Zoroastrianism which began by giving Mithra a very subordinate place, came to at last to exalt him to the right hand of the awful Or Ormuz Orm Orm Ormuz I never can pronounce that, who had rolled up within himself all the attributes of all gods whatsoever. When the Persians conquered the Babylonians who worshipped the stars in the most thorough-going manner, Mithra got himself placed at the very center of the star-worshipping cults, and won such strength for himself that when the Persian Empire went to pieces and everything fell into the melting pot with it, Mithra was able to hold his own identity and emerge from the struggle at the head of a religion of his own. He was a young god full of vigor and overflowing with spirits, capable of teaching his followers the arts of victory, and such things appealed mightily to the bellicose Iranian tribesmen, who never ceased to worship him in one form or another until they became so soundly converted to Mohammedism, Mohammedanism, centuries afterwards. Even then they did not abandon him altogether, but after an inevitable manner of co converts rebuilt him into Allah and into Muhammad so that even today one will find pieces of Mithra scattered about here and there in what the Mohammedans call their theology. And, and uh, we call them Muslims today, or Islam, uh, instead of Mohammedans. Um, after the collapse of the Persian Empire, uh, Prygia, where so many religions were manufactured at one time or another, took Mithra up and built a cult about him. They gave him this Phrygian, Phrygian cap, which uh, Phrygian, Phrygian, 
cap which one always sees on his statues they incorporate his rights uh, the useful of uh, the use of the dreadful tor torobolium which was a baptism in the blood of a healthy young bull oh torobolium okay makes sense in the course of time this glory ceremony became the very center and climax of the mithraic ritual and made a profound impression on the hordes of poor slaves and ignorant men who flocked into the Mithria as the Mithraic houses of worship were called. Mithra was never able to make his way into Greece. The same thing could be said of Egypt, where the competition among religions was very severe. But it happened that he borrowed something from Greek art, some unknown Greek sculpture, one of shining geniuses of his nation, made a statue of Mithra that served ever afterwards as the orthodox likeness of the god, who was depicted as a youth of overflowing vitality, his mantle thrown back, a, a uh, Phrygian cap on his head, and uh, slaying a bull. For hundreds of years this statue was to all devout Mithraists, what the crucifix now is to Roman Catholics. This likeness did much to open Mithra's path towards the West, for until his images had been hideous and in the distorted and repellent manner so characteristic of Oriental religious sculpture, the Oriental people, Oriental, the Asian people, I want to be uh, uh, language, linguistically correct, okay, it's not even politically correct. Oriental, if you don't know, refers to objects inanimate and uh, people of Asian uh, descent are referred to as Asian people not Oriental if you call a person Oriental he's likely to slap you anyway the Asian people among whom Mithra was born were always capable of gloomy grandeur and of religious terror but of beauty they had scarcely a touch it remained for the Greeks to recommend Mithra to men of good taste after the Macedonian, Macedonian uh, conquest, so it is believed, the cult of Mithra became crystallized. It got its orthodox theology, its church system, its philosophy, its dramas, its rites, its picture of the universe, and of the grand cataclysmic end of all things in a terrific day of judgment. Many things had been built into it. There were exciting ceremonies for the multitudes, such mysticism for the devout, a great machinery of salvation for the timid, a program of militant activity for men of valor, and a lofty ethic for the superior classes. Mithraism had a history, traditions, sacred books, and a vast momentum from the worship of millions and millions among remote and scattered tribes. Thus accountered uh, and equipped, the young god and his religion were prepared to enter the more complex and sophisticated world known as the Roman Empire. Two. How Mithra found his way to Rome. When Mithridates and Epidor, Ep, Eupidor, sorry, Eupidor, when Mithra, Mithridates Epidor, who hated the Romans with a virulency like that of Hannibal, and who waged war on them three or four times, was utterly destroyed in 66 BC, and his kingdom Pontus was given over to the dogs. The scattered fragments of his armies took refuge among the outlaws and pirates of Sicilia, or, or Cilicia, C Cilicia, yeah, and carried with them everywhere the rites and doctrines of Mithraism. Afterwards, the soldiers of the Republic of Tarsus, which these or, uh, outlaws organized, went pillaging and fighting all around the Mediterranean and carried the cult with them everywhere. It was this, in this unpromising manner that Mithra made its entrance into the Roman world. The most ancient of all inscriptions is one made by the Fred, freedmen of Flavins about, at about this time. In the course of the time, Mithra won to his service a very different and much more efficient army of missionaries. Syrian merchants went back and forth across the Roman world like shuttles in a loom and carried the new cult with them wherever they went. Slaves and freedmen became edicts and loyal supporters. 
government officials, especially those belonging to the lower, lowlier ranks, set up altars at every opportunity, but the greatest of all the propagandists were the soldiers of the various Roman armies. Mithra, who was believed to love the sight of glittering swords and flying banners, appealed irresistibly to soldiers, and they in turn were as loyal to him as to any commander on the field. The time came when almost every Roman camp possessed its Mithraeum. Mithra began down, to ne began down next to the ground, but the time came when he gathered behind him the great ones of the earth. Antonius Pius, father-in-law of Marcus Aurelius, erected a Mithraic temple at Ostia, seaport of the city of Rome. With the exception of Marcus Aurelius, the po and possibly one or two others of all pa uh, all the pagan empires after Atenius and Tanninus, were devotees of the god, especially Julian, who was more or less addle-padded and willing to take up with anything to stave off the growing power of Christianity. The early church fathers named, nicknamed Julian the apostate. The slur was not altogether just because the young man had never been a Christian under his skin. Why did all these great fellows, along with the philosophers and literary men who obediently followed suit, take up the worship of a foreign god imported from amidst the much-hated Syrians? when there were so many other gods of home manufacture so close at hand? Why did they take to a religion that had been made fashionable by slaves and cutthroats? The answer is easy to discover. Mithra was particularly fond of rulers and of the mighty of the earth. His priests declared that the god himself stood at the right hand of the emperors both on and off the throne. It was these priests who invented the good old doctrine of the divine right of kings. The more Mithra was worshipped by the masses, the more complete was the imperial control of those masses. Therefore it was good business policy for the emperors to give Mithra all the assistance they could. There came a time when every emperor was pictured by the artist with a halo about his head. That halo had original, had origin ally belonged to Mith originally belonged to Mithra. Okay, let me repeat that. There came a time when every emperor was pictured by the artist with a halo about his head, and that halo had originally belonged to Mithra. It represented the outstanding splendor of the young and vigorous sun. Okay, and after the Roman emperors passed away, the popes and bishops of the Roman Catholic Church took up the custom. They are still in the habit of showing their saints be haloed. Mithraism spread up and down the world with amazing rapidity. All along the coast of northern Africa and even in the recesses of the Sahara, through the pillars of Hercules to England and up into Scotland, across the channel into Germany and in the north countries, down into the great lands along the Danube, and he everywhere made his way. London was at one time a great center of his worship, the greatest number of Mithraea, were built in Germany. Ernest Renan once said that if ever Christianity had become smitten by a fatal mal malady, Mithraism might very easily have become the established and official religion of the whole Western world. <laughs> Men might <coughs> now be saying prayers to Mithra and have their children baptized in bull's blood. I will refrain from commenting. There is not here space to describe in what manner the cult became modified by its successful spread across the Roman Empire. It was modified, of course, and in many ways profoundly, and it in turn modified everything with which it came into contact. Here is a brief epitome of the evolution of this mystery. It, became, it began at a remote time among primitive Iranian tribesmen. It picked up a body of doctrine from the Babylonian star worshippers who created that strange thing known as astrology. It became a mystery equipped with powerful rites, and in Asia Minor countries it received a decent outward appearance at the hand of Greek artists and philosophers. And it finally became a world religion among the Romans. Mithraism reached its apogee uh, 
ap apogee, whatever, apogee, in the second century, it went the way of all flesh in the fourth century and flickered out entirely in the fifth century, except the bits of its wreckage were salvaged and used by a few new cults, such as those of the various forms of Man Manchism. Uh, part three, the Mithric Theory of Things. After overthrowing its hated rival, the early Christian church so completely destroyed everything having to do with Mithraism that there have remained behind but few fragments to bear witness to a once victorious religion. What little is accurately known it will be found all duly set down and corrected interpreted in the works of a, the learned Dr. Franz Cumont, whose books on the subject so aroused the ire of the present Roman Catholic hierarchy that they placed them on the index and warned the faithful away from his chapters of history. Today, as in Mithra's time, superstitions and empty doctrines have a sorry time when confronted with known facts. The pious Mithraist believed that the back of the stupendous that back of the stupendous scheme of things was a great and unknowable deity, Osmizund by name, or Osmizund, I can't even pronounce that word, I'm probably not supposed to, so, uh, <laughs> I know it's just another name for you know who, and so anyway, just like Mithra is, and so that Mithra was his son, and the soul destined for his prison, for its prison house of flesh, left the presence of Orsmund, Ormund, descended by the gates of Cancer, passed through the spheres of the seven planets, and in each of these picked up some function or faculty for use on earth. After its term here, the soul was prepared by sacraments and disciplined for its reascent after death. Upon its return journey, it underwent a great ordeal of judgment before Mithra, leaving something behind it in which in each of the planetary spheres, it finally paused, passed back through the gates of Capricorn to the ecstatic union with the great source of all. Also, there was an eternal hell, and those who had proved unfaithful to Mithra were sent there. Countless deons, devils, and other invisible monsters raged about everywhere over the earth, tempting souls, and presided over the tortures in the pit. Through it all, the planets continued to exercise good or evil influence over the human being. The planets continued to exercise. According to, as his fates might chance to fall out on high, a thing embedded in the cult from its old Babylonian days. The life of a Mithraist was understood as a long battle in which, the myth, with Mithra's help, he did war against the principles and powers of evil. In the beginning of his life of faith, he was purified by baptism, and through all his days received strength through sacraments and sacred meals. Sunday was set aside as a holy day, and the 25th of December began a season of jubilant celebration. Mithraic priests were organized in orders and were deemed to have supernatural power to some extent or another. It was believed that Mithra had once come to earth in order to organize the faithful into the army of Orsman. Orsman, Orsman. He did battle with the spirit of all evil in the cave, the evil taking form of a bull. Mithra overcame his adversary and then returned to his place on high as the leader of the forces of righteousness and the judge of all the dead. All Mithraic ceremonies centered about the bull slain episode. <laughs> the ancient church father saw so many points of resemblance between this cult and Christianity that as many of them accepted the theory that Mithraism was a counterfeit religion devised by Satan to lead souls astray. Time has proved them to be wrong in this, <laughs> because at bottom Mithraism was as different from Christianity as night from day. Well, yeah, sounds different. Four, in what way Mithraism was like Freemasonry? 
The Masonic writers have often professed to see many points of resemblance between Mithraism and Freemasonry. Albert Pike once declared that Freemasonry is the modern heir, heir of ancient mysteries. It is a dictum with which I have never been able to agree. There are similarities between our fraternity and the old mystery cults, but most of them are a superficial of a superficial character and have to do with externals of right or organization and not with inward content. When Sir Samuel Dill described Mithraism as a sacred Freemasonry, he used that name in a very loose sense. Nevertheless, the resemblances are often startling. Men only were admitted to membership in the cult. Among the hundreds of inscriptions that have come down to us, not one mentions either a priestess or a woman initiate or even a donatress. In this, the Mithraea differed from the Collegia, which latter, though they almost never admitted women as members, never hesitated to accept help or money from them. Membership in Mithraism was as democratic as it is with us, perhaps more so. Slaves were freely admitted and often held positions of trust, as also did the freedmen, of whom there were such multitudes in the later centuries of the empire. Membership was usually divided into seven grades, each of which had its own appropriate symbolic symbolical ceremonies. Initiation was a crowning experience of every worshiper. He was attired symbolically, took vows, passed through many baptisms, and in the higher grades ate sacred meals with his fellows. The great event of the initiate's experiences was the ter terobolium already described, and it was deemed very efficacious. I know I should efficac efficacious. Thank you. Very efficacious and was supposed to unite the worshipper with Mithra himself. A dramatic representation of a dying and rising again was at the lead, head of all these ceremonies. A tablet showing in base relief Mithra's killing of the bull stood at the end of every Mithraeum. This Mithraeum as a meeting place or lodge was called usually cavern shaped to represent the cave in which the god had his struggle. There were benches or shelves along the side, and on these side lines the members sat. Each Mithraeum had its own officers, its president, trustees, standing committees, treasurer, and so forth, and there were higher degrees granting special privileges to the few. Charity and relief were universally practiced, and one Mithraeist hailed another as brother. The Mithraic Lodge was kept small, and new lodges were developed as a result of swarming off when memberships grew too large. Manichaeism, as I have already said, sprang from the ashes of Mithraism, and St. Augustine, who did so much to give shape to the Roman Catholic Church and theology, was for many years an ardent Manichae and through him many traces of the old Persian creed found their way into Christianity. Out of Manichaeism, or out of what was finally left of it, came Polysianism, huh, and out of Polysianism came many strong medieval cults, the pot pottery, the Waldenses, the Waldenes, uh, the Hug Huguenots, uh, the, and countless other such developments. Through these various channels, echoes of the old Mithraism persisted over Europe, and it may very well be, as has often been alleged, that there are faint traces of the ancient cult to be found here or there in our own ceremonies or symbolisms. Such theories are necessarily vague and hard to prove, and anyway the thing is not of sufficient importance to argue about. If we have three or four symbols that originated in the worship of Mithra, so much the better for Mithra. <laughs> After all is said and done, the ancient mysteries were among the finest things developed in the Roman world. They stood for equality in the savagely aristocratic and class-riddled society. They offered centers of refuge for the poor and the despised among the people little given to charity and who didn't believe a man should love his neighbor. 
and in a large historical way they left behind them methods of human organization, ideas and principles and hopes which yet remain in the world for our use and profit. If a man wishes to do so, he may say that what Freemasonry is among us, the ancient mysteries were to the people of the Roman world. But it would be a difficult thing for any man to establish the fact that Freemasonry has directly descended from those great cults. Note, Kipling, who is never wearied of handling themes concerned with Freemasonry, often writes of Mithraism. See, his speci see especial his Puck of Pook's Hill, page 173 of the 1911 edition, for the stirring song to Mithras. Works consulted in preparing this article, The Secret Tradition in Freemasonry, Volume 2, by uh, e R Edward Waite, Book of Acts, Ex you know, Expositors, Mystery Religions in the New Testament, by Sheldon, Roman Society, from Nero to Marcus Aurelius, Sir Samuel Dill, the works of Francis Cumont, uh, Lecolte, Demetria, Gasquet, Gasquet uh, on Isis, Osiris, Plutarch, Plutarch and the Life of Pompeii, Plutarch, Annals, Tactius, Cor uh, Corpus Inscriptonum Latinarum, uh, Mithras Liter Liturgy. Um, and it just goes on. You know, it's just, re it, you can read, if you're interested in the sources here, I'll hold it here for a second. You can check them out. Um, Mackey's Encyclopedia, Revised Edition. Allah, Babylon, Egyptian Mysteries, etc. And she gives the pages there. So, I mean, yeah, that would be a modern day uh, possible reference if somebody wanted to look up the inspirations behind this article. Uh, so, and, and for such a short article, you see he uh, quotes a lot of sources. You know, so he. He went through a lot of uh, stuff to, to draw his conclusions. And that will conclude this one. <laughs> and I thank you for joining me.